Uh, we are kicking off a brand new series today called At the Movies, if you didn't notice that. Um, and it's going to be a killer series. It's four weeks long. This is week number one. So you've got three more weeks to come to, and I highly recommend that you come back every single week and next week that you bring someone with you, okay? It's going to be that great of a series. So I love it. We did it last year. It was one of the best series we ever did. And Hollywood keeps writing me material, so I'm going to keep preaching on the movies. Is that cool with you guys? I mean, I've got like a billion dollar budget for our movie clips now. Isn't that awesome? Like, it's really, really cool. So this week, we're going to take it to a uh, movie that some of you guys may have never seen. Uh, it's called Here Comes the Boom, and uh, it stars uh, Kevin James. And uh, Kevin James is a guy, uh, he's a, a biology teacher in this movie. And if you like kind of like a slapstick physical humor, you will love this movie, okay? He gets punched a lot. It's hilarious if you like that sort of MMA style humor, whatever. Okay, so it's a, it's a movie if you've never seen that. But Scott Voss is a teacher, in a, he's a biology teacher in his school. And uh, he doesn't really necessarily care that much about his class anymore. He used to be a good teacher, but not so much anymore. Then one day, through a series of events, he gets involved again. And this scene is what we're going to see the first time he starts really teaching in his biology class. And I want you to pay attention to the lesson, because the lesson is what we're going to actually learn from. So with that, let's watch a little bit of Here Comes the Boom. <laughs> Pretty cool clip, right? I love it because in that, in that clip, he talks about when one cell begins to die, it begins to pull down the other cells, right? But when the one cell starts to lift up, the other cells begin to get lifted up too. And he does this. They hit a rhythm, right? How many guys would like in your personal life to have that rhythm, that pace? Like every day, you're just rolling. Like how many guys have ever felt like... You're the opposite of that, though. Like, every time you turn around, there's a bump in the road. Every time you turn around, it's like you have a stop sign or a detour or a dead end. Or any, Anybody else been there before? Yeah. But today, we want to talk about hitting that rhythm. Today, we want to talk about, uh, like, the things in our life that will cause us to be healthy. And I've got an example for you. Uh, let me clear my little table here quick for a minute. This is our example. All right. It's a bucket. Did you know that? All right. Fine. Okay, but this is one of those buckets that's got a bunch of slats in it, or planks, or whatever one you want to call it, and our life is a lot like this bucket, all right? Jesus says that I've come that you may have life and life to the fullest. So this bucket can be filled to this high, right? Because all the planks have a similar length. But what would happen if I cut down one of these planks to a lower level? It would leak at that point, right? You could only get as full as the lowest plank. Follow me? right? Our life is like that. There's certain areas in our life that if we cut them short, we can never live life to the fullest. And this morning, I'm going to talk about four areas of health. Before I do that, though, there was a young guy that came to Jesus, and he wanted to have a full life. He said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes, he goes through six things. He's like, you got to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And the, and the guy, the response is right there in your notes. So if you want to pull your notes out, uh, it's kind of like a test that I give you the answers to, all right? So if you guys want to pull those out, I'll give you all the answers. But the first verse in there says this, teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. So the things that Jesus said, hey, do this, this, and this. He goes, I've got them. I've got those covered. And then continues, continue uh, looking at the man. Uh, Jesus left or felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. There was, there was one thing missing. There was one slat that was shorter than the others. There was one spot in this guy's life that was leaking. You follow me? I think all of us probably have at least one area of our life that is leaking, right? Where is it in your life? Well, we're going to go through four things. It's not, it's not comprehensive, but there's four major areas of our life that I've tried to kind of just ballpark for us. And, and I want to jump right in. Is that cool with you guys? No, not a single yes, not a single no. You're just, you're just looking at me like you're watching a movie, right? Are you guys ready to jump into this? Yeah. All right, area number one, your physical health. And it's back to quiet, all right? If we are not physically healthy, we're leaking. We're, we're not, we can't get as full as we want to be. And I got to be completely honest with you. And when I say I got to be completely honest, it makes me sound like I'm not always honest. <laughs> but I am always honest. This, maybe, let me be transparent with you for a moment. This is my hardest one. Out of everything I list today, physical health is my hard one. Because working out sounds a lot like work <laughs> and out. <laughs> like I want to be home, not working. But 
working out means I have to leave home and work. And I don't think I want to do that. It doesn't sound very appealing to me. And some of you guys are like, oh no, it gets my energy going. I'm so relaxed. And I'm like, bro, have at it. You know, like you're tweeting it and whatever. Like, look at these rocks, Instagram, whatever. You're, you're cool. Then also, I, I struggle with this because bad food tastes good. And good food tastes bad. You know what I'm saying? Like we were watching a show yesterday. We got home from the hospital yesterday and we're just kind of like zoning out. I put on like a TV show where they got burgers, right? And there's like, they have uh, Kobe beef burgers and buffalo burgers and the original burger. And then they're like, and this is the veggie burger. And I'm like, nope, I don't think so. It just did not look anywhere close to being nearly as good as a real burger, right? And I was just like, nope, I'm struggling with this one. It's not there for me, right? Anybody else with me on that one? Does it mean I can't be physically healthy? No, but it does mean that I have to try, I have to go beyond my natural instincts and try and get healthy, right? But I'm not talking about just like an external working out, eating healthy, but there's a lot of things internally that can determine your physical health. Did you know that? If you look at the book of Proverbs, I want you to check this out. This is written by a guy named Solomon. In chapter 14, it says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body, and jealousy is like cancer in the bones. You want a healthy body? You have to have a peaceful heart. It doesn't matter if your resting heart rate is like 26. It doesn't matter if your cholesterol is perfect. It doesn't matter if you could bench press a Mack truck. But if your peaceful heart, if you don't have a peaceful heart, you can't be as healthy as God intended you to be. Right? Sometimes we just need to slow down. Sometimes we need to rest. God tells us, take a Sabbath day, which is take a day off where you do nothing but fun stuff. And working out is not fun stuff, all right? It doesn't count. Eating healthy is not fun stuff for me. You guys may enjoy that, whatever. But, but take a day off. Get some rest. That's going to lead to a peaceful heart. Does that make sense to you guys? Get a day where there's no stress, and you're going to have a healthy body. And then jealousy is like cancer in your bones. We know that cancer in our bones is bad, right? Everybody got that? But that's jealousy. That's what jealousy does for us. If we have animosity towards someone, if, if our heart is not at peace, it's going to hurt us a lot. If you're, if, you, if you're living with unforgiveness in your life, where, you, where somebody hurt you and you're just angry every single day, you're going to put a cancer in your heart. And it's, you're not going to have a physical healthy body. Science has already proven that time and time again. Next one, Proverbs chapter 16 says this, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. You want your body to be healthy again? You need some kind words. Not just spoken to you, because we all like that, like, hey, you're looking good today. Like, I know, thank you, I feel good, right? Like, you know that kind of stuff? Like, like y'all look good today, thank you. Are you guys feeling better already? Yeah, like, you know, whatever. But you also have to speak kind words. If you speak kind words, you're, be- you're going to be healthier internally. When we release a-, a compliment to someone, when we release something to someone else that is positive, it actually builds us up. It really is better to give than to receive, especially when it comes to our words. So be the first person to be like, hey, did you lose weight? You're looking awesome, right? Like, oh, I love those shoes. Hey, you did such a good job singing or greeting or making popcorn or, you know, like all these things. Like, just, just let someone know that you did great and, and those kind words will come out and you're going to be better off for it internally. So that's our physical health. And I know some of us, like me, we struggle. So we have connect groups, right? We have a couple of connect groups out there that they're actually doing physical activity. Amazing, right? So if you, if you want to go mountain biking, we've got a group for you. Get out there, hit the trails, pump some whatever. Maybe eventually if you crash into a tree, that wouldn't be as healthy for you. You know, I wouldn't recommend that. But, but getting your heart rate going, that's good. We got flag football out there. Amen, hallelujah, football's back. <laughs> I love it, I love it. That was probably all the teams that won and all the rest of us were like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> but football's back and we have flag, flag football every other Saturday. You guys can sign up for that. Get your heart rate going. Go have some fun. Get some physical activity because when our physical health dwindles, we can't live a full life. Make sense? When you don't have physical health, it slows you down. You can't live a full life. So do what you can to get that health inside of you, all right? Eat right, exercise, be healthy in your heart. Number two is financial health. And I know a lot of pastors apologize for talking about money in the church. I'm not one of those guys. Because Jesus talks about money more than anything else. So if I want to be like Jesus as a pastor and a, and a person who's shepherding this congregation, I will talk about what Jesus talks about. And if you, if you guys know it, when you're financially stressed, doesn't it mess up everything else? Marriages, most marriages that are in divorce or have divorced cite money as one of the number one reasons for that divorce. 
Finances affect everything. You ever been at work wondering how you're going to pay the rent or the mortgage? You ever, you ever uh, been throughout the day just worried, like, how am I going to send my kid to school? Back to school is happening. Where are we going to get the money for this? I'll put on the credit card. Great. Now the credit card's due. And that's due. And this, like, you've been there before, right? We're, we're not living to the fullest because we've got something missing, right? We're not financially healthy. We've got things upside down and backwards. It hurts, right? And you guys know that when you don't have finances put together, you can't live to the fullest because you've been there too, haven't you? I've been there. It hurts. It's no fun. But check this out from the book of Proverbs. Once again, very, very wise guy, Solomon, says this. Uh, from Proverbs 22, just as the rich rule over the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is servant to the lender. How many of you guys like that phraseology right there? Do you like to be servants to people? But if you have debt, he says, you're a servant to someone. And I would say that's the number two rule for having a financial healthy life. Number two is living without debt. Number one, you want to know what number one is? You put God first in your finances. When you become a giver, it's, it, God does something great in your life, and he multiplies stuff. He, he multiplies your, your giving. So when you give, you put God first, and all of a sudden, he's on your side. He's working for you. I've never, I've always uh, uh, given, and I've never had a money problem. Does that mean I'm rich? Nope. Does that mean I uh, have everything I've ever wanted? Nope, but money's never been an issue. I've never had a lot, but I've never had a money issue because I've always put God first. And I'm going to talk about in November, we're going to do three or four weeks on what God says about money because it's a hugely important part of the gospel and what God says. So we'll, we'll take that out. I'll do a lot more of this in November to kind of help us grow. Uh, so number one, put God first in your finances. Give. Be a giver. I, God, I, God loves a giver, man. Uh, and then next is get out of debt. Because I know a lot of us, we kind of go through life with a lot of debt, and it's stressful, isn't it? Like if I ask you, hey, do you own your car? Yeah, I own my car. Signed right on the line. You don't own your car. You're making payments on it, dude. The bank owns your car. Does that make sense? Right? I, I own my house. Right, right. No, no, no. They own the house, and you're paying them for it. Does that make sense? Like, like we are not free financially until we are debt free. Does that mean I don't think you should ever have any kind of debt whatsoever? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you are overloaded with debt, it's unhealthy. And there are some things you can do to prevent that debt. So when you have debt, your money uh, is going towards something plus interest. So your money is actually creating debt for you. Isn't that a good thing, right? Okay, but then when you have that money, you're not putting it into uh, debt. You're putting it into an investment or into savings. Your money is actually making money for you. Which one would you rather have? Think about it. Money making debt, money making money. <laughs> Get out of debt. Use your money for something different. If that means you have to drive a lower quality vehicle, so be it. Do you know what kind of car I drive? It ain't great, but I'm also debt free. And I live every day free. When, a, when the car breaks, I don't care. I just go to my savings account and I pay for it. Because I didn't pay that much. I don't have a payment every single month. So be debt free, please. Financially healthy. Man, it is quiet in this church. <laughs> you guys are all like, eh, he's preaching to me. I don't like that. Okay. Uh, well, I'll move on to the next verse then, okay? Actually, actually, there's a connect group out there to help with this too. If you guys uh, find yourselves in a situation, not that you're broke or not that anything, you just want your, to tell your money what to do instead of your money telling you what to do, there's a Financial Peace University class back there. Sign up for it today. If you need help with a scholarship for it, because it does cost $100 to get all the materials and everything just for you, if you need help with that, uh, let me know or let that group leader know, and we'll set up scholarship for that, um, and we'll set you guys up. Cool? So tell your money where to go, Financial Peace University. Next verse, Ecclesiastes, written by the same guy, Solomon. I love, love, love this verse. Check it out. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God. Pause. It is a good thing to receive wealth from God. Too many times, people with money are villainized. Oh, they got that way by cheating, they're not generous, blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that at all. Because I know a lot of people that are wealthy that are very generous. And they got that way because God put them in that place. Because God knew that they would do good things with the money he gave. So it's a good thing to have wealth from God. And the verse continues, and the good health to enjoy it. That's point number one, right? What's, <laughs> what good is it if you have all the money in the world and you have no health to enjoy it, right? You got to take care of point one, point two, and then it continues. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. To enjoy your work is a gift from God. 
I'm going to do a series next year called I Hate My Job or something like that. Because I know there's a lot of people that live in this world and they go, why do I go to work every single day? We're going to, we're going to hit that. But if you enjoy your work, man, is it a gift from God or what? It's like you're not even working. It's like you're just doing things for fun and you get paid. It's awesome. But not only that, it, to accept your lot in life is also a gift from God. Check it out from the book of uh, Philippians chapter 4. I didn't put it in the notes or it's not going to be on the screen. I just want you to listen to this real quick. This is the Apostle Paul. And he's talking about being content, be accepting where God puts you today. And he says this, I am, or, or, I am not saying that this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever my circumstances. He continues, I know what it is to be in need. You've been there? I know what it is to be in need. Uh, I, I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. And then here's the famous verse, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You heard that verse before, right? I can do everything who gives me strength. You know what he's talking about there? He goes, living within your means. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. He goes, I've had a lot, and I, and I conquered having a lot by God who gives me strength. And when I had a little, I had nothing, you know what I did? I relied on God to get me through that time, and I just lived within my means. I've learned the secret of being content no matter what, no matter if I have a lot or a little. That's a gift from God, isn't it? How many of you guys would love it just to be completely satisfied with your financial state right now? Yeah? You can be. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. All right, let me continue with this verse. I love this last line on here. It says this, God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. God, when you're physically healthy, when you're financially healthy, here's what God says. I'm going to make you so busy enjoying your life today that you have no time to worry about the past. You have no time to worry about the things that were done to you. I want you to enjoy your life now. And when you're healthy, that sounds like a full life to me, right? Because here's one thing I do know. You can't live in the past and in the present at the same time. You can't be worried about yesterday, be brooding about yesterday, and enjoy today simultaneously. It's not going to happen. It just doesn't happen. You can only live in one place, and that's today. So go ahead and take advantage of what God has given you. Enjoy life today as it is, and be happy. God's got that for you. He wants that for you. He wants you to be at peace. Uh, check it out. Number three in your notes is relational health. Relational health which I just love this one. The Bible has a lot to say about relational health. Uh, we, if you want to know more about uh, dating, marriage, uh, all kinds of fine, uh, healthy relational stuff, go back to our June series called Once Upon a Time. Um, we covered a lot of ground. We did it for four weeks, way more than I could do right here, right now. But go ahead, jump, go back to our app or our podcast. You can jump on that. Um, but I love what James says, because James gives us the secret to winning relationally. How many of you guys want to win relationally? I do. I mean, not like, not like win every argument relationally, because you can win an argument and lose the relationship, right? You can be right and wrong at the same time. And all the married men said amen, all right. Because <laughs> you could try to be right, but you're going to be wrong, dude, all right? That's, that's all there is to it. And, and James says it like this. He goes, understand this. Understand, comprehend, take it into your brain, grasp it with your heart, understand this. This is the secret for a healthy relationship. Check it out. Check it out. Uh, it says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be, all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. You want to win in a relationship? Those three things. Quick to listen. How many of you guys know that's not your natural reaction, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> slow to speak. For some of us, that's really hard, and slow to get angry. And others of us, I'm not even going to have you raise your hand or anything. You know, you know that's you, right? Be slow. Be quick to listen. You want to win in your relationships? It starts with you. That's what James knew. You can't control their actions, can you? But you can control yours. So be slow to speak and quick to listen and, sl and slow to get angry. Do those things, and you're going to win relationally every single time. Your, your relationships will get stronger. So here's, here's what I kind of picture in people's lives. Like, like we're kind of, we kind of put ourselves at the center, like we're the sun, and we have all these people revolving around us because we're the main character in our TV show, right? Like, welcome to the TJ show. You're just a part of it, right? Like, you know, like all of us do that. 
And the common character in every scene, in every fight, in every dysfunctional relationship you have is you. Ha, ah, really quiet up in here now, right? It starts with you. If you want healthy relationships, don't change all your friends. Don't change your spouse. Don't change your kids. Change you. Get better at being slow to speak. Get better at quick to listen. Get better at slow to get angry. And your relationships will improve immediately. Immediately. James knows that it starts with you. Jesus says it like this <laughs> in Matthew chapter 7. He goes, hypocrite. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that's what he says. <laughs> hypocrite. You hypocrite. Look at yourself. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So here's, here's the analogy. He's saying you're trying to help someone with that little speck in their eye. You ever been there where you're trying to help someone get something out of their eye? He goes, how can you do that when you've got a log in your eye, dude? He, he's saying before you go all Dr. Phil on someone, and be like, we've got a problem, right? And you're the problem, right? Like, before you do that, he goes, examine you first. You want to win relationally? Look at the log in your own eye. Look in the mirror of God's word and compare your life to God's word. Guess what? You're going to get relationally a lot healthier because healthy relationships start with one relationship, and that's your relationship with God. If you don't have a healthy relationship with God, I firmly believe that the, your other relationships will never grow deeper than they are right now. But when your relationship with God grows and your peace in your heart grows and, and, your, and your health grows and your, all your other planks are starting to move up, and your relationship with God starts to grow up, your relationships will go up with it. Believe that with all my heart. Leads me to number four. Check this out. This is the last point, but don't check out on me, okay? This is the most important one, spiritual health. Spiritual health. This is not like a slat in the bucket. This is the bottom of the bucket, all right? You have absolutely no hope of holding water unless you've got spiritual health going on. You, you will be empty. Your life Jesus says, I've come to give you life to the fullest. Unless you're spiritually connected with God, the bottom's falling out every day. It, it, it may seem like you're holding water for a while, but guess what? The bottom will drop out eventually because life is hard. Life is really hard. And so when we, when we have spiritual health, though, it carries us through those times. And, and, and something within us grows deeper and deeper because of what God is doing for us. Check it out from the book of Psalms, chapter 38. He says this, uh, my health is broken because of my sins. Let me pause on that for a second. My health is broken because of my sins. He's not talking about necessarily a physical health, but he's talking about a spiritual health. My spiritual health is broken because of my sins, because sins are not just physical things. They're spiritual things. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of, you remember the God's top 10, the 10 commandments, like don't murder, don't lie, don't steal, those kind of things. Jesus says, hey, that's, those are good things to not do, but I'm going to take it a step further. He goes, Murder, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder there, and that's a sin. Jesus is taking the line from physical action is sin to spiritual action is sin. So when David says, my health is broken down because of sin, he's talking about a spiritual thing. Jesus took the line back time and time again. He says, adultery, don't commit adultery, obviously, right? Like he says, don't do that. But if you've looked lustfully at a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart, and that's sin. He's saying, again, my wounds, it's a spiritual wound. There's something stinking about me. You've been there before where you, like, you did something, and it wasn't even something physical, but you thought that, you went there, you, you did that, and you kind of go, my attitude smells really bad right now. You've been, like, you got, like, what's a natural reaction to, like, something that you just, like, have you ever been in an environment that's just smelly spiritually? What do you, what do, you do? You kind of put that face on? Yeah? No? Nobody else? I, the world, everybody does this. Uh, I've got a picture of Will Smith's family, all right? <laughs> Check this out. Let me see it. Can we see that? No? Yeah, see? Okay. They're at the Video Music Awards. You guys heard about this, right? But they saw something that they're like, that ain't right. That is, I love this kid's face right here. He's like hurt. He's like, he needs counseling, right? Like, that's what that looks like. Uh, but that's what happens, right? All right, you can take that picture down. You can take that down. But check it out. <laughs> Honestly, though, think about it. Think about it. Have you done that to yourselves? Because I'm not here to judge uh, Miley, right? I'm not here to do that. I just gave you a reaction by someone else. But I think in your own life, you'd be surprised how many times you do that to yourself. Have you ever go, oh, I'm so stupid sometimes. Been there? Can't believe I did that again. 
we, we, we kind of, we, we know what this is. We don't always identify it well. And we kind of, I'm spiritually unhealthy. I can smell the unhealth in my own body. You know what I'm talking about? But the good news for you and the good news for me and the good news for Miley is that Jesus came to wipe that away, right? Check it out. Let's go, let's go back to this. In Mark chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. When Jesus heard this, now Jesus is uh, eating with some sinners, some people that don't smell so good, right? Just like you, just like me, just like the aforementioned families and people and stuff, okay? Uh, he says this, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I love it how he concludes this. He goes, I have not come to call, I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they're sinners. I've not come, I'm a doctor, and I've come for sick people. And I've not come for the ones who think they're healthy, the ones that say they've got it all together, the ones that, that look perfect on the outside. I've come for those people who know they're sick. And I, I'll stand up here boldly before everyone and go, I stink, man. There are days when I'm just, I don't, I don't have it. I'm not perfect. Are you perfect? No. I think every one of us in this room would be like, you know what, TJ? There are days <laughs> when I smell bad. There are days when someone could look at me, and if they knew what I was thinking or feeling or what my heart was, they would just go, oh, that stinks. You been there? We've all got that junk, but the good news is Jesus came to remove that junk, that sin, very Christian word, right? That sin from our life. And he did that by dying on the cross for you and I. You see, sin separated us from God. That, that, that filth, that junk separated us from God. But today, we don't have to live that way because Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of those sins. There was a sacrifice that was made for you and I to wipe out that debt of sin. And when that w debt of sin is wiped out, now we can have a relationship with God. We are, we are what a Christian would call saved. We're saved, we're set free from the slavery of sin. And I don't know about you, that's a really good thing. And when we take advantage of what God has given us in the spiritual side, our spiritual health, it's going to build up everything else. I, I definitely believe that our relational health will grow when we have good spiritual health. I believe that our financial health will grow when we have good spiritual health because God influences every area of our life. I believe that even our physical health will improve when we have good spiritual health because spiritual health means a peaceful heart. It means you're a new creation. God made you new. And I think that's where it all begins is with number four. Because well, we can look at a very superficial, a very shallow level of all of these things. Physical health, do I have a six pack? Check, right? Like, got it, man, <laughs> which I don't, by the way. Uh, you know, but that's, it's something deeper. Is your heart peaceful? Does that make sense? Like, it's something deeper than the actual, like, am I ripped? No, no, no. Is my heart at peace? Do I have that jealousy, that cancer in my bones? Uh, what about uh, your financial health? Do I have money? Check. Yeah, I'm healthy. No, no, no. It's not about money. It's about your priorities and where your heart is. The church gets accused all the time of just wanting money. Listen, I don't want any money. God wants your heart, though. And he knows that if he has your heart, he's, he's got all of you. And a lot of times it comes out in us because we have a greater love for money than we do for God. And that's why we're like, oh, that hurts. That smells bad, whatever. Don't, don't just look at the, the financial health and go, yes, I've got money, or I don't have money. I'm unhealthy or healthy. It's much more than that. And then relational health. Yep, got friends. Check, done. No, it's so much deeper than that. Take a deeper look. Are you connecting with people in a way that, that God has designed you to connect with them? And then spiritual health. Let's go deeper than just, I read my Bible today. Let's go deeper than just, I showed up at church on a Sunday. Let's go deeper than that. Let's talk about how, hey, I talked to God today. And he talked to me. And he spoke to me through his word. And my life is totally different. I've got, I've got a relationship with him. And today, I want that relationship with, with God and you to start if it hasn't started already. Or if it's faded. You know, because sometimes we can just kind of back up. Like we're face to face with God. And we're like, oh, look, shiny things over here. Distractions. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves distanced from God, right? Today, let's step back up. 
Let's get back face to face with him. Because he probably feels a million miles away to some of you guys. But here's the deal. God doesn't move. We do. We do.